Well, I'm Mark Savvy. I'm a, um, a core developer on API Management Project, which is an open source API management uh, solution. And I'm going to um, explain a little bit first what API Management is, as I know there are some people who know exactly what it is and some folks who aren't so familiar. So if you're more familiar, feel a bit patient. We'll get through that relatively quickly. And then um, I'll go and explain a bit how it can be useful in different contexts like microservices and um, then we'll talk a bit more about the specific implementation and how we've architected API map and some of the cool stuff around Java that you can do with that. And then um, I'll do a demo because I think it's one of those things that is really compelling as a demo. So um, I think um, it's going to be relatively quick for time, so I'll go fairly quickly. Right. So this is a really oversimplified graph, but this is our traditional approach for how we imagine and how lots of people draw in their, in their diagrams and they're showing to their bosses how you interact with an API. I have a couple of apps, I have a few APIs, they interact with each other through some sort of amorphous mechanism directly to each other. This is all, all seems relatively simple. Except that's not the reality of a production API, right? In fact, there's a whole bunch more complexity there. This is, this is more like reality. So, we have to, as a developer, there's a, there's a part where we need to interact before we ever start writing, uh, anyone will start using our code. So uh, we may need user management, we may need API key management, especially if we're talking about sensitive services like banking and medical and so on. We may need to have some kind of service level agreements for different types of users. And of course, there needs to be an auditing process, even on the sign-up process. So we make sure that only people that we, we expect have access to our APIs do and we know who's doing what. So this is all before we've ever gotten to writing our app. So then of course the developer goes and writes his application and then he has a whole bunch of stuff that needs to be on the API at runtime as well to enforce lots of the stuff that we've, we've done beforehand. So in this case I've given some examples. Uh, we want to do all 2 or OpenID Connect to do authorization. Um, authentication. Um, we want to check the key to make sure that we, we the correct user is called or we, we associate with the correct account. You may want to do some kind of detailed authorization to make sure. So we might know who the user is, but they might not be able to do the action that they're trying to take. And then, of course, we have things like enforcing these SLAs, doing billing, logging metrics, and all this kind of stuff. So really, this is all before we ever get down to the logic. So this is a whole whole bunch of um, extra stuff that we need to, to do beforehand. So just to break this into a, into a more generic and general form, this is the design time part of the top, right? So this is before, this is, this is where we're deciding in advance, this is a user essentially coming and interacting with the system and saying, figuring out which APIs you want to publish, uh, which users are allowed to access this, managing API keys, managing policies. So by policies we mean stuff that we want applying before we reach our business logic. And then we get down to the runtime part. And then we have things relating to IDP, so identity management, identity um, verification. We have a whole bunch of security features that we might want, like OAuth and like SSL, TLS, etc. We have key lookup and management. And we have technical policy enforcement, so I talk about this is more kind of um, stuff like you know circuit breakers and things like that. Um, and then we have business policy enforcement, which is the stuff that your boss can tell you to do, like oh, we want rate limiting, we want quotas, etc., etc. And then of course we have logging metrics and events. So uh, no one anymore just wants a, an API to have to sit there and do its thing without knowing exactly what's happening. We want to know when failure is happening. We want to know how many people are using it, when they're using it. Uh, we want to know when bad things happen, that kind of stuff. So, API management. I think you kind of get an impression of what it is already, but it's, it's the centralization of common API functionality. So it's important functionality that's difficult or undesirable to implement in every single one of your APIs. So we're talking about things like security, rate limiting, caching, circuit breakers, quotas, any kind of custom policy that you can think of. and. Um, of course, most of this is, is ultimately about controlling access to your APIs and the way that different users can access your APIs. But the, the point here is that you're pulling, you've got fine con uh, grade control of your API and um, you're facilitating lots of business requirements at the same time. Of course, a, one of the huge parts of this is that you're extracting this, all this complex functionality away from your application and hiding that behind your API management layer. 
we'll talk a little bit more about that. So going back to, to, to our application again, we can see that this is, this is the kind of architecture we would see when we're using API management. So first of all, we have our developers who are interacting with the design time part of the system, the manager side as part of the system. So this is where people are going to find APIs. On this side, we have providers who are going to publish our APIs somewhere. So you have a registry for people to publish into, you have a place for people to register for accounts, you can manage those accounts, you can manage billing, and you can view metrics, etc. And then this configuration is pushed at runtime, uh, pushed to the runtime gateways. So essentially, this is a reverse proxy. You have some applications, and they instead of accessing our APIs directly, we're now going through one or more gateways. Um, to access these APIs. And of course, we're applying those policies we were talking about, whichever policies we've configured, um, at this point, instead of on our APIs. So just a few words on um, API management and microservices. So everyone is talking about microservices at the moment. But I think there are some interesting aspects um, for API management and microservices in particular. Although I do think they're broadly, broadly quite common. So. Often you have many, many small services. One of the problems is that you need a place to discover services. We're not just talking about a registry for programmatic discovery necessarily. We're talking about for developers to come along and find stuff and know exactly what the the, uh, the API is, how to call it, um, you know, the, the, what sort of contracts might be available. So, for instance, if you want to offer different levels of service, what levels of service are available. It's also a fantastic place to, to capture metrics and statistics because, as you can imagine, from this, you're sitting in between pretty much everything. So you can collect a lot of very useful information, and it has an independent life cycle to your API. So in the case that, for instance, your API goes down, um, you can still continue collecting useful metrics. So it could be a, a, a very useful place to actually find out when the stuff's going wrong, what stuff's going right, who's doing what. Um, so you're reducing the scope for errors. In a lot of cases, I think particularly for security, as well, lots of, I know lots of our users particularly like API now, because security is kind of hard, and it takes a lot of time and effort, particularly if you put a large number of services, and it might be in a, a large number of different languages. You don't really want to have to be re-implementing all of two, um, you know, verification or whatever on all of your different services. Ideally, you know, you can pull all this stuff out by doing API management. Then, of course, um, it's nice if, if some business guy comes along and has some kind of new requirement that you need to apply to your APIs and you're offering it to people. You don't want to have to go and implement that in 20 different places. It's much nicer to be able to do that in one policy in one place and just apply that on your existing APIs without even needing to change them. Um, also, so uh, API man speaks REST. Uh, in the future, we may be looking at other protocols, how we might, be do, might do API management and messaging that kind of thing. Um, all I have to say, the main thing people so far are interested in um, is, is REST, although there are a few people who want to use SOAP and things like that. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it also provides a, nice, a natural barrier between the inside and outside world. So um, sometimes people struggle knowing which services they, they have are just for internal consumption and which ones are for external consumption and, and how to demarcate between the two. With API management, you have, you have a set of gateways, and someone has to go and actively publish that. So there has to be a decision on someone's part to say, OK, I want this to be offered to the outside world, and I'm happy for this type of user to access it. So you have a kind of explicit process for offering stuff. So some people use the API management gateways as a, on their kind of DMZ, right? So they will, that will be the point where people can access their stuff. No one can jump around the gateways. So it's, it's really a separation of public and private as well. Um, I think also um, analyzing lots of these services don't necessarily have any kind of ability for people to understand how people are using them because they don't necessarily collect lots of metrics. Um, and we can do that so you can get a much better understanding of how your application is being used, who's using, using it, when they're using it, etc. So now to talk more specifically about API Man. So API Man is split into two parts. There's the API Manager and the API Man Gateway. So the API Manager is the design time part, which is the the, the stuff that your developers and publishers and so on interact with. Um, and this is for publishing, managing, configuring APIs, for discovering APIs, um, it's for doing user management, uh, visualizing metrics, and looking at audit logs and all that kind of nice stuff. Um, when I show you the UI, 
I think uh, one real important point to emphasize is people always ask this is, can you do all the stuff you can do in the UI with the API? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, the UI just uses the same API that anyone else could use. So any, you can do more with the API, I, would, I should think. Um, and most of the stuff that you see is bundled. So when it comes to registries, it comes to storage layers, etc., you can, there are different ones in, available in the community already, but you may want to plug your own in if you have a, some kind of special requirement. The API gateway, so this is your reverse proxy. This is sitting between your client and your APIs, and it contains a subset of the configuration of the API manager, a simplified subset, just the stuff it needs to run really quickly. Um, it applies those policies and API requests at runtime, proxies and foo. Obviously, if it decides that that, that request is uh, not allowed, then it can cut it off and short circuit it straight away, and it never gets to the back end. And a really important point here is that it scales independently of the manager. So one of the biggest things about something a project like this is that uh, performance and latency are very important. So if the performance is terrible, the first thing all the developers are going to say is can we throw it away because it, it makes everything suck, we hate it. Um, so we, we've had a lot of effort into making sure the performance is good. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But essentially the gateways scale completely independently. There's a push relationship between the manager and the gateways. Um, and there's pluggable components, again, for the gateway. So if you want different data stores, you can do that. And it's actually async by design. You can embed it into different platforms. So if you have a, a custom platform that you want to embed an API management gateway into, you can do that. Um, async, obviously, things like Vertex, that's got really good for low latency and throughput and scaling. But potentially, you, you want to use a simpler platform, like you know, a war or something like Wildfly or EAD. You can do that as well, because we have, we have those. So diagram to, to give a kind of clearer picture of what we're talking about. So here's our manager at the top. We have the manager is available in EAP, Wildfly, and Jetty. We have our UI layer here, which speaks to our REST API. We have this backend storage, which is completely separated from the runtime data storage. So there's never any contention between the two. Our users inter are interacting with UI and doing all their fun stuff with publishing APIs and so on. And we have our gateway down here, where um, this is where our, the REST clients that we have will proxy their traffic, and we'll apply all those policies we've configured. We can have between one and n gateways um, using components for shared state and so on. And um, hidden behind all this, of course, there are our real APIs, and they're basically not the wiser <coughs> about um, this gateway being there. So from their perspective, you, you often don't need to change anything to do with all of those APIs. You can just hide it, hide it as a detail. And of course, the policies may want to do interesting stuff like reaching out to JDBC or LDAP or doing REST calls. Um, I'll talk a little bit more, more about this shortly, but there's a, a full custom plugin system. So you can write, you can implement your own policies to do absolutely anything you want. And this is, of course, written in Java. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about what policies can do, because I think sometimes um, it's not necessarily too clear. So this is a permit and deny policy or a filter. So the client makes a request to some kind of policy. So in this case, it checks whether the source IP is within this given range. If it is, then it proxies the request to the API at the back end. The API will then respond through the gateway saying, hey, should be OK with some, some data, and that will be proxied back to the client or the call. However, if they don't match this particular filter, then they will receive a forbidden and it will never touch the API, the gateway will terminate that request and throw back the error directly to the client. So you're completely short-circuiting the process and you're taking the API itself out of, out of the loop when it comes to this kind of stuff, any of the policies that you're putting on there. Next, this is a modified headers and payload. So um, API man policies can't, you, you can fiddle with headers, you can do yes or no type stuff that we've just uh, seen, but you can also mutate the body. So you can change body bits. It comes through as a stream, so you need to be, you need to be clever about um, how you're doing that potentially. If you, if you have multiple chunks and you want to match between multiple chunks, it can be done reasonably. This, this provides a sort of really high performance solution. Um, so the client in this case makes a request. This is only for transforming the response, so it proxies the request directly through to the API. Once it reaches the API, the API responds with its normal format, which in this case is some XML, saying, you know, XML, foo, 
bar, ping, whatever, API, man. And that comes back through the gateway. Once this policy hits this policy, we configure it to transform the XML into JSON using some configuration hidden inside of there as well. And what pops out is this nice JSON string. And that's what was returned to the client. So this sort of stuff you can, of course, modify. Modify headers, you can add headers, remove headers, you can modify the body, you can replace the body. You can do more or less anything. You can even change the destinations, uh, moments of path, whatever you want to do. Um, so that's kind of interesting, but what if we have multiple, one, multiple policies, we potentially want to uh, compose behavior together, right? So in this case, we want to do authentication, then we want to do authorization, and then we want to do some kind of transformation of our response. This is a, um, a I think this is quite a typical use case. And in API Man, we have a, the concept of a policy chain. So you essentially can organize the policies that you want to apply to your API and put them in the order that you want them to apply and they will pass to each other the results after mutating or doing their decision on whether this traffic's allowed to pass it on. So in this case, we do authentication with go auth, auth2, open ID connect. Um, we figure out that the user is called admin and they have the roles foo and bar. Let's imagine that they're allowed in this case, so this passes on to the, to the, next, um, to the next policy, which is then authorization. So this is, this is now receiving the roles that the previous policy has, has discovered. And um, using the roles in there, we, we decide, okay, we need roles through and bar, and of course, the roles are there, and we then pass on to the transformation service, which passes on to the API. This is Johnny for the response, so it will just proxy straight through. So our API response, of course, a typical problem is that you come back with, it may have URLs embedded into it that refer directly to that API rather than to the gateway, and you want people to call back through the gateway. You don't want to call them, them to call the API directly anymore. Um, and um, so URL rewriting will take that, replace the old URL with the new URL, and then pass back through. So in this case, we were only interested in the forward part, but on the back part, you can just pass it directly through, because on the, in this case, there's nothing exciting to do on the, on the reverse leg of authorization and authentication. Of course, you can imagine your own policies being in this chain, all sorts of things you could do. Now, what about the case when something goes wrong? or you've denied something. So in this case, we've decided the authentication is correct, but they have the wrong roles. We were expecting foo and bar, but they had roles A and B. In this case, the last policies, any policies further on the chain are never called. We short circuit immediately and return back to the client with whatever error that policy decides is appropriate. So custom policies. This is a, one of the best parts of API Man, I think, is that you can add arbitrary new functionality via, via code, Jargon. And um, they're equally as powerful as inbuilt policies. You can do more or less anything. Uh, this, you know, for mutating, for routing decisions, for um, yes or no kind of filtering, you can do all that kind of stuff. It's a very simple uh, plugin format, and it can be deployed via Maven. So internal Maven servers or external ones, of course, you can just use standard um, directories and things as well. But that means that you can. API Man will figure out the plugin that it needs to load and it will pull it in from your Maven repo. So even if you have lots of gateways, lots of servers, um, it'll figure out what it needs to, to apply that policy. There's also the UI aspect. So in the manager, of course, you have a UI. If you're contributing a plugin, you may want to have a UI so that your users can configure some settings in your, in your policy. And we do that via um, JSON schema. So we'll generate a really nice form for you. In the cases where you have a more advanced requirement that you want to write some JavaScript to do some really advanced validation, that's something we're working on. will be available in the community soon. Uh, we have some stuff for um, testing with JUnit, and um, so you can do full full testing without any pain really. And uh, we have a whole bunch of these plugins in the community already that you can go and have a look at to get inspiration, or there's a reasonable chance that what you're wanting to do is already been done, so it may be available. So things like we've had users contributing JSONP, transformation between different data formats, um, certain things are adding and removing headings, that kind of stuff. So one slightly advanced part um, is API Man components. So I talked about this a little bit earlier, but essentially most of what you see in API Man, the underlying stuff is, is pluggable. So potentially different people want different types of behavior from the components that they're using. So they may want an eventually consistent data store, they may want a strongly consistent data store, they may want different types of regulating. 
um, there are really so many different nuances that um, you can't necessarily provide for everyone. So we have um, a bunch of different components available. For instance, we have an infinity span um, rate limiting, and we also have one in Elasticsearch, and uh, we have some in-memory ones as well. But you can implement your own. Some people have done that because they want particular types of behavior for those um, components. We also have things like for, you know, for registries, for pushing data into your metric stores. We have uh, components for those, and you can put your own connectors, logging, etc., etc. So that's the basics of it. I'm going to do a demo now, and um, hopefully it should be interesting. I think for those people who don't really see the point of a demo or don't rock it fully, I think when you do a demo, um, you convert a few people. Right, so I'm going to change into uh, mirror mode quickly. So an organization is the, the rough equivalent of a GitHub organization. So it's a kind of it's essentially a namespace. And we're going to create our APIs and so on within this namespace. So I'm going to JBCN conf can be my organization name. Uh, JBCN conf org. Right. So I've created my organization. So um, I'm going to go ahead and create an API. So one interesting thing you can do, of course, is, is Import an API manually if we know where its endpoint is. So, as it happens, um, I have an API running locally already. So, it's not very exciting. All it does is return to me the request I made plus a counter. So, we can see the number of times, oops, we can see the number of times I've made a request. Every time I refresh, the counter increases. So, I've got 10 requests now. Um, of course, because I'm using a browser, it will return XML by default, but it can return JSON as well. So I'll decide I want to offer this really valuable service to the world, and I'm going to create a new API. So I'm going to call this my Echo API, and it echoes everything it is. And we'll name the initial version 1.0. Create that. Uh oh, oh well, layout. So if I flip down to the uh, implementation tab, um, I can see it's offering me to offering to put in uh, an API endpoint. So I'll paste that in there. Uh, it's REST API, and I want all my error messages and so on returning in JSON. And you can add API security as well. So if you're not in a situation where your network is locked down, you may want to have neutral TLS, for instance, between your API and the gateway so that people can't sneak around the gateway and call your API directly. Um, this is a, a request from the community. I know lots of people will just use network to lock this down. So I'll save that. Um, definition is where we can put a swagger document, and um, this will allow people searching for our service to see a rendered swagger UI so that they can 
understand how to call the API as well. Um, I'll not use that for now, but I'll come back to it in a little bit. Plans, so we can offer our API via plans, um, meaning different levels of service agreements, so a silver plan or a gold plan, with different numbers of requests, let's say, for each one. Um, of course, in certain cases, we just want to offer an API. We want everyone to be, have the same policies applied. It's a public API. We don't care who's calling it. And so for, the, for this particular demo, I'm it's a public API. So we don't give anyone an API key. We just give them everyone the same endpoint to call. And let's save that. And um, policies. So this is the interesting part. And if we go to add policy, we can start filling out our policy chain. So the first one I'll do is basic auth. Um, so let's add uh, a realm, well, JVC, and that'll do. And we'll say that transport security is required. Note that the, port, the service itself doesn't have transport security. Um, we can forward the authenticated user as a header if we want, and I'll require basic auth. Um, for the demo, I'm going to use static, um, a static source of information, but of course you can use JVC or LDAP or something like that. And so I'll have the user admin, admin, because no one ever gets that, and add this policy. So there we go, our first version, we have a policy sitting in front of there. We haven't published it yet, but if we look in our change log, we can actually see everything we've done so far. So we can see we added this policy, we can see um, the attributes that we set for different stuff. So now I'm going to go ahead and publish it, because we can see that um, the API man knows it already. Publish, and there we go. So that config is now being pushed out of the gateway. And I have a gateway, of course, running on this machine. And if I go into the uh, endpoint tab, then I can see the managed endpoint. Oops, I'm just breaking the equipment. Don't worry, guys. Um, and the managed endpoint is down here. So you can see that it's no longer direct to this. So this, it is now, we've now been given a nice uh, endpoint to hit that goes through the gateway. And you can see our organization name there, service name there, and the version. So we're going to give us the call. So yep. we can see it's an HTTPS service now as well, which is how we set it up. So of course I made a cell sign certificate, so Chrome doesn't like it, but we'll ignore it. And there we go. So now we've hit the first policy. I'll put the username and password in. And there we go, we get through, and now we're applying authentication. That's pretty cool. Now, what if we want to do something a bit more complex? So we've now got both, but we might want to add, for instance, rate limiting. So I'm going to make version two of this policy. And I'm going to go to the policies, and I'm going to go add another policy. So version two is essentially, when you add a new version, you're cloning an existing one, and you can modify its config. So in this case, I'm going to go to add policy, and I'm going to go and flip down to rate limiting policy. So we're going to say that this particular use, that anyone who calls this is, is allowed, let's say, this API is allowed 10 requests per API per, let's be really stingy and say per day. You're only allowed 10 requests a day, like a bank or something. Um, add that in. So you can actually, um, reorder these policies by dragging them around, but this, this order's fine. So in some cases you may want to apply, so for instance if we had rate limiting first, it probably wouldn't make a whole lot of sense because um, you would generally want to authenticate before you do your rate limiting. So you can drag these policies around. So we'll go ahead and publish this, and we'll have a look and see our endpoint. Now we've got another endpoint, essentially the same as the previous one, but with um, version 2 on the end. So I'm going to flip over into my terminal here and open up a new tab. Just change the tab. Um, you can see it's pretty really large. I'll make it a bit larger. There we go. Is that visible? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay, so I'll do a curl and to here. And um, the first thing that should happen because I've not put any all details in is that all will be denied, right? So there we go. We can see that basic, basic authentication is failed down here. And we can see the, auth, the failure type in the header as well. Um, that we were trying to do some kind of auth with this realm, but we didn't provide information. So, um, whoops. So I'll add that in. 
and there we are. Now our request goes through, but we can see that the second policy is now being applied. So we can see right on the thing how many are still remaining after this request has been made. And so if I keep hitting the service, now we can see that the rate limit has been reached. So um, that's coming through from the second policy. Thank you. Um, that's coming through from the second policy and having transited through the first one already. So all we need to do is wait for that rate limit to, to expire and we'll be allowed to do requests again. So there we go. So we've done a combination of two policies this time. So of course there are, there are a whole bunch of different policies that come with API man. So we have things like basic caching, whitelisting, blacklisting, rate limiting, time restrictions, quotas, URL rewriting come out of the box. You know, there are also a bunch of plugins that come in the community, like um, the weekly rate, so circuit breaker, calls, HTTP security, uh, pull off to, all this kind of stuff, some transformation policies as well. Now, one other cool thing that we'll just talk about is registries. So putting everything in by hand is nice, but what if you have a registry inside your organization? There are two things you can do. So one is, for instance, in Fabricate, if you, if you use that, um, you can, it can import, automatically import APIs into API Man magically by using metadata defined um, on the endpoints, well, Kubernetes in general. Uh, or you can search through the registry. So I'm going to create a new API, so I'll uh, see if I can one. So I'll go to my organization, and I will um, go to APIs, and this time I'm going to import this API. So this is, this is pulling it in from a registry rather than defining it all by hand. So I'll search for an echo, some kind of echo service. I can see there's one in here, in the registry. Um, and I'm going to go in ahead and import that. So if I flip over to the next tab, I can see it will let me choose some plans. So if I de define some service levels, then um, this is where I pick them. Next step, go ahead and import. And there we go, we've imported this service, finish. And there we are, you can see there's the one we did by hand, and here's the one at the top here that we just imported from the registry. So if we go and have a look at that, we can see that the swagger definition is already in there because it's come from the registry. And if I just go ahead and publish this with no policies, um, we can see that I'll get an endpoint through the gateway for me, and there we go. Of course, it's the same service in the back, back end, but... Now, one quick thing. If I make a new version of this, version 2, and we decide that we're going to go ahead and we want people... We, we don't want everyone to, to have to access them at the same terms. We want to have some notion of a, a key that we give to different developers so that they can pay, for instance, pay for different levels of access. Or have different policies, for instance. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, untick this from being a public API, save that, and I'm going to go back to our organization and I'm going to create a few plans. So I'm going to make a silver plan and silver uh, average. Frame that. And I'm going to go and put a policy on there and it's going to be rate limiting policy and it's going to have that's going to have five requests per client per Day. So the clients are people coming and subscribing to our APIs, essentially a mobile application or Java app, for instance. So I've created that, I'm going to lock it, I'm going to go back here, I'll make a, another plan, make a gold plan, slightly better than average. And this one, I'm going to add again rate limiting, but I'm going to add Twenty requests per client per day, and lock that. So if I head back to my API, I can decide for this API that I'm going to offer it underneath the gold and silver plans. Just take these. There we go. 
So now imagine I've logged back into the I've logged into the system as a developer and I want to come and find this really exciting echo service. Um, I'm going to go and go into this organization. Um, I'm going to create a client app. So it's going to be called my mobile app. It's going to be, I don't know, my super agile microservices cloud. Any more buzzwords for you? Ninja. I don't know. Okay. Um, oh, Ninja's not cool anymore now, is it? No one uses that. Um, so we're not bothered adding any policies. What we're going to do, because we can add policies to here as well. So for instance, a classic case of that would be data transformation. So if I don't like the format that's coming back, I could transform it just for my client app. So I'm going to search for some APIs to consume. So I'll search for this echo service again. And you can see this is the one here that we're interested in. JDT and conf echo API and echo demo API. And we can see the uh, there's one version available, and we can see there's an API definition for it. It's not a very exciting one in this case, because there's um, not a whole, whole lot of interesting stuff to do with this API. But we can see there's a full, the full Swagger documentation is available there on the API itself, when people search for it, so that's pretty cool. And, um, oops, I forgot my, forgot to publish that API, one second. Operate that error. So now I have a contract between the client application, this mobile app, and through a, um, an SLA, which is a plan, so a particular number of requests, and then onto this API, which is available through this plan. Great contract, done. And now I'm going to go ahead and register that. Of course, I could register multiple APIs if I want, I could apply some policies, etc., etc. So now I've registered, and it's going to give me an API endpoint. Um, so if I click on this down here, I can now see I've been given, again, the URL to the gateway, but this time I have an API key, which I can either transmit as, um, as a parameter or as a request, as a header. So this just identifies which client we're in, we are. So if we go ahead and flip that into my browser, I can see with that API key, I get through to the service straight away. But if I fiddle with that API key, make it wrong. It breaks, it says, no client found. So that's the very basics of API Man. I realize I've given you a very quick um, run through of that. Um, it's a really exciting area. I think there's, there's lots of work to be done around formats, around um, all sorts of kind of custom policies that people have been working on that are really interesting. And um, yeah, I hope some of you will have a look at it and start working with it. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Oh no. Oh, one no, back. You see about the BS, BSA is a plan that uh, in, in, in it will reach now if you should uh, this plan is CFFI or? Sorry, I can't quite hear. Uh, you, you, you choose the, the known C and I for integrating the, the API or um, the silver the silver Oh the different levels of service. Yeah. So what, what about it, sorry? Which which norm did you did you implement? Which norm? But I don't think you use any norm. No. It's uh, it's it's our it's your own Yes. Yes. Okay. I have a question. Um, is it possible to have a policy that instead of emitting one request, we limit several requests to several services, aggregate this and get that? Yes. Back? Yes, you can definitely potentially do that. Um, at the minute, we haven't. We're, we're not sure whether that should be something we should leave to the likes of Camel and so on, but it's something. It's certainly something that we can do. Yes? How do you handle error? Some failing API that you have proxy? How do you handle it? 
So um, it depends yeah, what you want to do. For instance, you, as people have written policies that will fall back onto a different API, so for instance, it will fall back onto a different endpoint or a different load balancer, you can do that. Uh, by default, of course, it will just return the error that came from the back end. The proxy is true. But yes, you can configure different things. Um, also, we have a circuit breaker policy, which is a bit like Hysterix, uh, which can do some interesting stuff um, when services start behaving badly. Um, another thing that lots of people do is monitor the, uh, the elastic search logs. So that's one, that, that's one we ship with by default. We have other metric stores as well. And they will integrate that with things like Grafana and Kibana. And then they look in there to see when they notice patterns of bad behavior uh, and change things. Really good question. Yes? yes? Uh, do you have any failover from the gateway? Um, so the gateway, it's, it's not a single gateway generally. Well, you can't have a single gateway. But there's a, we have this concept of components which provide shared state. So for instance, you might use um, a, a reliable distributed data store like InfiniSpan between your different gateways. Um, so even if one of the gateways goes down, goes down, the state that was accumulated on the on the other nodes should still be there available to the other nodes. So that's how we provide resilience. Um, so yeah, that that's should be okay. Any more questions? Yes? How much of it does it add to the application? Yeah, someone always asks that question. It's a hard one, it's surprisingly hard to answer. So um, in of itself, so the, 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 the answer is it entirely depends on which policies you put into the chain. So if you put policies, policies into there that are really expensive, for instance, if you spend your whole time calling out to a JDBC database, it's going to be slow because you have to wait for the database to call, call to come back. You have to you know, pass all the information in there really slow. Whereas if you're using something like OAuth 2, for instance, or OpenID Connect where you have a token and you can verify all the information using a, just using basic cryptography. That is really, really fast and adds only a, a very small overhead, you know, tens of milliseconds, potentially. So uh, one of the big things that we've focused on is making sure that uh, we keep latency as low as possible from just the internal parts of it like that. So essentially the only performance problems would be whether you've implemented a policy that's very slow, for instance, so the, the API man core itself is really fast. Uh, but yeah, it's a, that's a really important area because you know, no one wants all that stuff to be really slow. <laughs> yes? Can I add some custom, customized policies? Like I can develop it in Java yes. and put my own policies? Yeah, so I was talking about that just at the end. Um, well, I'll just, just describe it. So essentially it's a, a really simple war format. You provide a little bit of metadata uh, to describe your policy and so on. And yes, you, uh, you provide a very simple, uh, you just implement a few interfaces and you can go ahead and plug those into the into API map. Um, you can also publish those artifacts into Maven, for instance, or into your internal Maven repo. And then all the different gateways, when they see that they need that plugin, they'll go to Maven and pull it in the first time they need it. So this, it's a really simple mechanism, distributing your custom code around the place. Yeah, so it's really simple, and lots of people are using it. So I think that this is the real power of using something like code over um, a configuration-based approach. So you see some API management solutions where you write lots of XML, where you write lots of JSON to describe what you want to do in your policy, but ultimately you can't really describe everything. Whereas if you have a, a code-based approach like we do, I think that provides you a heck of a lot more flexibility. Of course, the only slight downside to that is you need programmers, people who don't have the right Java to, to implement these policies. But I think most places have at least a few confident Java programmers. As long as you can do async code, you'll be good to go. Yes? Yeah, I have another question. Um, the, the example was based in one point, but uh, it is possible just to proxy uh, a whole bunch of um, endpoints from a given path. Um, so, so you mean using multiple, uh, yeah. the same API but replicated? Like setting a policy for all uh, endpoints to start on a given path. Yes, you can do that. Yeah, so you can do a whole a bunch of stuff with path shading and with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes? As I understood, should you be able to see your logs 
you have to integrate this with some ELK ELK okay law. <laughs> so that's one thing I forgot, so thanks for reminding me. So if I flip back in here, I can actually see some metrics for what we've just been doing. Um, there's not nothing very exciting has happened, um, let's say, for the last hour. Uh, response types. So there we go, we can see, this, these are some really basic visualizations that come with API Man. Of course, if, you, if, you're in, in, you know, if you're putting it into something like Profana Kibana, you get much more advanced stuff. But for really basic stuff, we do have some nice visualizations. And this is coming from Elasticsearch, for instance, which I've got running on here. And um, we can see 80% succeeded, a small number failed, etc. Of course, it doesn't look quite like this, by the way, when you, when you view it on a, in a normal resolution. It just thinks we're using a mobile phone in a minute. <laughs> so, yeah, good question. Any more questions? Yeah? Uh, in order to, to have access to, to a database, uh, you, you, you are logging the transaction uh, of the database. So if, if I want to, to have a, a function which have access to, to a database mm -hmm. and uh, the transaction paid, Mm -hmm. You are in a, in a, in a, in a logger? A logger to... Oh, I see. Right. So that entirely depends on how the particular component that's doing that work is implemented. So we have some that will do JDBC logging, for instance, of metrics, and depending how you implement that, the, the behavior will be specific to implementation. Whereas for something like Elasticsearch, we, there are no transactions, transactions with Elasticsearch. Um, you just throw that data out there, and then if you lose a few parts of it, then, well, the idea is that it's so what, because um, it's more important to be fast than to have transactions. That's the Elasticsearch approach. With JVC, yes, you can use transactions. Um, you are using G unit? G unit? G unit? For, for testing, right? Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, sorry. I'll come and talk to you about this one afterwards because I've just been told we're finished now. So. <laughs> Um, thanks very much for your questions. I'll just be outside so everyone can continue talking anyway. Thank you very much for. for <laughs>